now. My name is Joseph Wonderlich, Professor of Engineering, Architecture, and Computer Science. This is an introductory course in uh, computer architecture and uh, high-tech fundamentals. I'm going to sc share screen. That. So uh, my website, uh, you'll be able to find this course on my website. Uh, there's lots of details in here. Just go to syllabi and you'll see all the syllabi there. And we're in this course right here. Uh, also in, um, okay. Uh, also in Canvas database, uh, we use at Elizabeth Town College. <clears throat> so I've been teaching this course uh, for 23 years. Uh, it's evolved from how to put a PC together, which was a novel thing to do 23 years ago, to uh, quite a bit more things in there now. Uh, look at the course syllabus. Uh, very brief, quickly for the students here. Now this, uh, this, I'm teaching this now in spring of 2022 and recording this. I may play this recording again at another time in the future. So just realize that if you're not, it's in the future someplace right now, listening to this <clears throat> on YouTube or wherever. Uh, these assignments uh, are topical. This is a topical course. And so now all the assignments for the semester are up there, including your final exam. You can see all the points and when things are done <clears throat> um, are due. And uh, we have a couple of cybersecurity things in there. We had a big uh, thing that was going to be due right before spring break, but uh, uh, considering the, the Ukrainian invasion happened right as spring break was about to start, I thought maybe not load on anything more stressful to think about. So everybody had spring break. This is now, uh, uh, or this extra credit cybersecurity thing uh, here. The students all read this national security policy thing. Uh, there's also another cybersecurity homework coming up with a guest speaker we'll talk about later. Uh, and then there's other things in here, finding employer, venture capital pitch, uh, high tech companies, other things <clears throat> for this iteration of this course of this semester in the year of 2022. Uh, the course syllabus, <clears throat> we use that to guide through the course um, and uh, guide us through the course. And it looks like this. And uh, if, uh, group things together here now. It's the same list of things as before, although I've added uh, something in here. So we've gone through all this other thing, these other things down here, and we're in here right now. And so I'm going to uh, today do human vision. And uh, we just did physics of technology way. So this whole grouping here includes graphics boards, monitors, understanding human vision versus machine vision. Uh, you know, my, my background is in technology architecture too, uh, and you know, mostly high tech, but I'm also an architect uh, of buildings until I was age 30 and I'm 60 years old now, mostly computer engineering past 30 years. Uh, but I, I delve into other things, don't profess knowledge as a neuroscientist or a psychologist. I do teach the capstone uh, course in the cognitive science minor for the computational branch of that. Uh, so I, I, I can mingle in those uh, worlds. And we're going to look at um, now human vision and uh, the physiology of the brain and how vision, human vision is different than machine vision. And then we have something uh, that's from my architecture courses that I teach, which is on lighting design. And I think that's, uh, it adds some light, if you will, to uh, the uh, understanding of how humans feel about light and deal with light. Then you want to think about that when you're designing technical systems. And then we're going to get down into uh, the, the physics uh, uh, and the technologies of displays, uh, plasma screens and LCDs and how those work uh, down to the detail level. And then into graphics cards, graphics boards, and uh, what's driving all of this. So this is a big chunk here. We already did physics of, uh, and technology of waves. <clears throat> And we're going to go into this now uh, with uh, human vision. Now these are um, have PDF and PPTX with audio. 
Uh, now, if I played the PPTX with audio, there's a couple of video clips that I click on there, and it's a little disconnect. I mean, you can do it with the PPTX with audio if you're playing a PowerPoint. You can, you can pause it or you can click on the video and come back in. Uh, but if you don't do it at the exact right time, it's a little choppy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the PDF and then I'm going to go into YouTube. Uh, I'll have to open the PDF for clicking on links and then I'm going to go into YouTube and actually play the recorded video and we're making a new video on top of this now, but in the context of a bigger thing here. So you'll see little notes, these little red asterisk stars here. And what that means is the videos have extra narrative and visuals added to the videos, uh, to videos in 2022. We're doing that now. These, I never taught online until COVID, uh, but it's, when COVID started, I started making these lectures online. So what we're doing is now taking a 2020 COVID, uh, initial COVID lecture, and we're wrapping around it and with more narrative and uh, more, more as I'm doing now. All right, so um, let's do that. So we're gonna go into, uh, down here, we're gonna go into PDF, let me open that. Uh-oh, let's see what's in the chat here. Uh, what? Okay. <clears throat> seen that chat. Okay, so uh, this is human vision. And we're going to start off by playing this uh, Vsauce video with I also want to go to my YouTube channel now do that here. <clears throat> go to the YouTube channel, go to the playlists. And you'll see in there, um, the playlists for uh, high intro high tech lectures, this is this course. Here. And so this whole playlist is just for this course. And then I have advanced high tech lectures and other things, architecture and other things. So we're going in here. Uh, we're down in here. And I've started whenever I wrap around a previous recorded lecture, YouTube video, I have been putting this picture up. I might change that though. So. <clears throat> But so you can see, I didn't wrap around these here. These are the floating point ones, but I wrapped around these, all these here. So these are all newer videos. And now we're wrapping around this one here. Lecture on human vision uh, in the context of a course in uh, computing and high-tech fundamentals, computer architecture and high-tech fundamentals. And so we want to understand human vision so we can better understand the machine vision and what the computer processes. So uh, firstly, we want to uh, watch this little video clip here. So click on that video and watch a little YouTube uh, video. And then it's video clip. That, uh, video. So first is beta movement, what beta movement is. Uh, so if uh, images uh, move fast enough, the human brain can't comprehend them as separate images. Uh, so there's an illusion of motion created. And uh, you know, initially in old movie films, uh, a sequence of still photos recorded chemically on you know, photographic film, you've all seen what that looks like and just go fast enough with all the individual images and it looks like motion. Um, now, uh, the video uh, is a sequence of electronic images captured at a frame rate. So it's a similar thing. So frames per second, you want to think about that with uh, image processing and video capture. The human uh, eye and brain, um, well, they're different. Um, the brain receives a continuous stream of electrochemical data um, in response to the photons incident on the retina of the eye uh, as we track objects. And then the visual cortex, you can see in the image below uh, of the brain, uh, holds uh, info information for about a fifteenth of a second. 
Uh, so if images change more than 15 times per second, the brain, the beta movement effect results in our thinking there is a smooth motion. Um, and then if an animation moves faster than that, it will seem fluid. So um, I mean, I don't expect you to memorize all the parts of the brain here, but just you know, take a little look at that. Take a second to look at that. You don't have to click on where the images are from. And then down this note below here, uh, a human will uh, get a headache when watching videos with too high of a frame rate. Uh, so this is a problem with the computing actually going faster with the, uh, with, you know, frames per second beyond what your, your brain likes uh, because digital capture does not uh, typically add motion blur, blur like the human brain does uh, uh, to really fast moving objects. And so uh, there's a way of compensating for that in the hardware, but then you need to consider that, that there's a certain rate that your brain likes, uh, you know, can handle really. You know, too slow of a frame rate and it's going to look choppy and you won't perceive it as motion when you look at it too fast you're kind of overloading your brain in a way and uh it's not uh it's not it's not good you can get a headache now we want to talk about another, a couple other things having to do with uh machine vision, image processing, and uh, human image processing. And so first watch this second video called What is the Resolution of the Eye? All right. uh, but do listen to the video first. And so um, uh, resolution compared to a camera or screen, typical electronic resolution is measured by the number of pixels. So here's some standard technologies, uh, past and present. So VHS tapes uh, is uh, 0.15 megapixels. So you see a 480 by 320. Yeah. Um, CDs, optical, standard lasers, two, 0.27 megapixels. A little bit higher, 0 0.35 megapixels. So mm -hmm. Then IMAX, right? That's a special way of recording that. That's seven megapixels, super high resolution. But just going to be broadcast on a huge screen. So uh, certainly higher pixel density then if you're on uh, you know how you gonna view it and so when you actually when you compress files you like when I was making these talks here I've compressed the audio audio and the video and, the, and then you have choices of how it will be displayed so uh, you know, I'm picking a resolution that's good for the computer and you know okay project it on a screen in class for viewing but you wouldn't want to see it in a movie theater like with that pixel resolution so you want to consider that when you're uh, you know, what resolution makes sense. A phone certainly doesn't need a lot, a tiny little screen, uh, but a computer, depending on the size of your monitor, could use a little better. Um, and then the movie theater is a whole different thing. Uh, you know, however, you know, resolution is more about distinguishing fine details, which includes more than the pixel density. It's a function of these, a number of things here. So, uh, you know, just the number of pixels, certainly, but also the amount of light, uh, the size of the sensors, uh, and what actually the millions of uh, pixels are encoding. So, uh, you know, we'll see a little more of this when we get to monitors. So, if this is not completely understandable here, just wait and you'll see a little more. Um, how we uh, you know, we'll learn about RGB, red, green, and blue, and how those are mixed in the computer, different intensities, 
uh, to mix and make the light that we, uh, the colors that we see. Then, uh, you know, uh, the fifth thing here is how close the object is. Some things clearly seen up close. Uh, if you see clearly up close, blend into the background at a distance. And then on a small enough screen from far enough away, low and high resolutions on a screen aren't resolved differently by the human eye. So you have to consider the physiology of the human eye and brain uh, when you're picking resolutions and when you're looking at monitors and TVs to, to purchase uh, different technologies we want to talk about, different types of display screens, LEDs and LCDs and plasma, and some of the newer technologies we'll, we'll be getting to. But you want to consider that when you're uh, picking your computer monitor, your gamer, if you want a big giant screen, or if you want to connect your computer to the TV, right? Or you want to you know, have your computer be essentially your part of your entertainment system, which is becoming more and more the case now. Um, and that changes the variables and how you interpret what you need. Couple more things we need to consider for resolution. Uh, number six, uh, spatial resolution, how different nearby pixels are. Um, for example, if you keep a number of pixels the same, but go out of focus. Um, and then a better question uh, in the video here is what is the resolution of the eye for comparing human vision to digital image? So we'll see now that the brain does and the physiology of your eyes do something certainly different than you would do with a camera, and digital computer imaging. So um, how many pixels on a screen do you need to fill your entire field of view and make it look like real life without any detectable pixelation? So this gets a little trickier because you know, in digital image processing, you just assume you're capturing a uniform pixel density over the whole thing, and that's what you need. And you kind of do because people might be viewing different parts of that image at different times. But when you are a human looking at something, we do it differently. So uh, think about that, how that might factor into your, your image processing of your computer how it's different at least with the human so um you know so it says here you know as i've written down however a camera captures an entire frame at once but our eyes move and our brain amalgamates a constant stream of info now, the info we capture is, uh, in a single glance is actually very poor compared to the camera and we filter we filter out info that we don't care about or that doesn't change, like your glass rim of your glasses or your nose. I mean, you could actually see your nose if you think about it. And your rim of your glasses, which you don't want to concentrate on, you just filter it out. That's part of how your brain is processing this information. Um, number four here, we only receive high quality info you know, 2020 vision uh, and optimal color vision in the center two degrees of our field of view, only two degrees. So it's a like small little middle. I'm like, what? How? You know, you think about that. Uh, and it's controlled by the fovea Latin you know, pitfall part of the retina. And so you can look at the physiology there. Um, and, and so um, your eyes are actually moving around. Well, we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, number five here, we have a blind spot. A little test you can do with that you see in the video. It's actually a blind spot where the optic nerve connects to the back of the retina. But you know, we're, we're filtering that out because our eyes are moving. So you know, how are we filtering all that out? Uh, you know, we compensate for all of this weirdness of our physiology. And the fact that we don't really see as much as we think we do, we're just looking in a you know, 
certain you know, blind spot, you're only in the blind two percent uh, in the field of view that you're uh, actually really seeing with high high resolution or two degrees, not two percent, two degrees. Um, and so we compensate for all this by um, our eyes constantly moving and uh, dragging that resolution, that two degree resolution all around where we need it. And then our brain's complex visual system with two eyes, you know, triangulating, giving us perspective, but also moving around. Uh, our brain's complex visual system fills in the details by merging images from both eyes and making guesses on neural network. Now we're gonna to to learn a little bit about neural networks in here, just an introduction later on, but you'll see it's uh, essentially guessing in between known, uh, known stimuli and desired output pairs. Um, interpolates, extrapolates. To uh, take a look at how uh, we view things and what kind of uh, uh, difference between, you know, for, for colors and distinguishing colors, distinguishing shapes and distinguishing text and how we uh, you know, use our, our range of degrees of uh, angles of uh, our viewing field for each of those. So, um, and here's a, a link that you can go to uh, to look at some of this, but uh, assumptions are made to estimate the complete life-like field of view. I'm just reading what's below here at uh, at all times in a 120 degree field of view. Right, that's pretty much our field of view, uh, even though we can see somewhat for 180 degrees. Right, but uh, I'm just gonna, not going to read all that. They get the idea here. I want to go on to the next thing. Um, in the class, because I want to pack this in here. And uh, da, da, da. Uh, let's see here. we want to go to this lecture here. And this will go a little bit. Um, I like this particular lecture because it uh, somewhat merges my uh, five year architectural engineering uh, education at the University of Texas, Austin, and Penn State, two years urban design. and. University of California, San Diego, and then architectural work until age 30, plus my master's and PhD in electrical and computer engineering uh, after that. And so it's a, a, a merging of those two worlds for me. The main uh, reference sources here will be our uh, this textbook that we're using on heating, cooling, and lighting, and also the uh, Illumination Engineering Society handbook, as well as uh, a number of other sources. So firstly, we always wanna make maximum use of the sun, the natural lighting. Now passive, you always wanna do passive things first before active. And these are some photos from Rome that I took in 2011. So we wanna speak of daylighting first. Uh, first go back uh, students and just take a quick uh, look at chapter seven, the, the HVAC passive solar heating and also the Roman architectural and engineering. We've already spoken about some of this history, so I'll go quickly through this. Um, uh, until the 1800s, uh, uh, no artificial lighting during the day. And, and, and so uh, going back in history now, Western civilization, we see what Romans uh, did in, uh, some of the ways they first started bringing in uh, light with, uh, and the structure, the flying buttress on the cathedrals allowed for the uh, more openness and, uh, as opposed to uh, a huge, thick exterior structural wall. Um, you can... I'm going to jump over some of this. It's mostly for architecture students. I want to get to the uh, technical aspects of lighting, but not skip too much of this. So I'll skip through the history here of the history of lighting. Uh, but I want you to get some of the psychology that goes into it too. A, a spiritual belief, if you will, or a philosophical belief to open things up. However, I'm not going to go through all the details here. It's somewhat of a, a spiritual belief, if you will, or a philosophical belief in some of the, uh, uh, the, the things that manifest itself based on how you deal with the sunlight. So you can read through these different things. 
how to orient the house and the windows, where to put the rooms. Uh, then in Japan, uh, more recently now, this is a stepped mountain home, uh, which makes use of uh, light as well as wind, water, and shadows. And you can see how the sunlight's coming in here naturally. Different floors, different ways. You can imagine different times of day. Uh, this is a project of mine uh, 30 years ago, um, opening up this building, this, uh, this house. Uh, the, put the, I put these skylights in facing the southern. Uh, there was only uh, the southern view. Uh, there was only uh, windows on, uh, window on the north and west side. And the west side was blocked because of a house up on a hill. In the Roman, the Roman times, they had sun rights, actually laws for that in England in 1200 AD from adjacent properties from being blocked with uh, platinum, gold, silver. Um, the daylight effects, but sometimes it's uh, uh, beneficial. So we have a. I'm skipping over a number of these things because it's not applicable for you guys in here, but I just want you to see dealing with light is not a trivial thing. And more diffusion of light, you can get different things. So that, this is a is a baseline standard uh, using an overcast day, and then you change based on uh, where you are. Well, in most cases, but the heat from the sun that you get did quite a bit in uh, buildings in uh, in the West, uh, including the um, uh, solar heat. There are nine uh, in Texas with uh, things that I was participating in building. Now, students recalling chapter nine, uh, 10, passive cooling and shading, we already took a look at some uh, properties of glass, uh, including the um, uh, solar heat gain coefficient uh, and shading coefficients. And we spoke of uh, reflective glass that, uh, that I worked with in uh, Texas and California, as you can see in these projects below. Uh, nowadays, these are also uh, typically low E. Uh, now, our daylighting factor, um, you can assign uh, feelings of how people will feel, you know, the, the atmosphere, the ambiance. Uh, so the, the, um, the uh, daylighting factor below 2% is gloomy feeling, uh, 2 to 5%, uh, uh, you feel like it's well lit and or it is day lit. And then um, above that, it's, you feel it's vigorously day lit. Now, there's illumination gradient that we've mentioned before, uh, directing, uh, reflecting uh, to get the uh, sun indoors. And then also the building orientations, which we've talked about before uh, in a couple of places. So recall in chapters 5 and 11, uh, in site design, uh, orienting so south, north, east, and west for different uh, uh, things that we're considering, design considerations, also skylights, and, and uh, if the sun's too intense, you might want to put blinds on them also, which I end up doing, doing on that one project I already mentioned. And you can see more on uh, those kind of things with uh, uh, shading in uh, previous lecture in chapter 9, 10. Passive cooling and shading. Now, how to get the sun deep into the building? Uh, a list of uh, a nice list here uh, from the text on heating, cooling, and lighting, and <clears throat> these shapes that we mentioned before that uh, we may want to and have in in other ways. Louvers in Pennsylvania, like central location, to light, and uh, most important how humans, how we people um, feel about it. So uh, it's, we're designing architectures for buildings. Engineering too, uh, for people, is for people. So uh, spatial orientation, where you are in time and space, well, space, not time, but also time is number two. Uh, form identification, edge detection, you know, where you are, where your edges, where your boundaries are. Activity enhancement uh, can enhance your works work productivity and enjoyment, define a personal space, you feel nice and safe and you have your own territory, happiness, uh, you know, overall we, we need daylight, uh, real or simulated, you can do it with some artificial light, which we'll see actually in this lecture, it's not easy to do, 
getting nice even distribution of all the uh, different wavelengths of light that uh, make up natural sunlight. Visual diversity needs, right? We need a little bit of change. Uh, uh, order needs, a little different for different things for different people. Security, you know, well lit for safety, certainly. Um, light poetry. So this is more artistic uh, thought here. So sunsets, sunrises, sunlight on a stream, fountains, waterfalls, koi ponds, light on water can be very uh, uh, desirable thing to do. Um, uplighting on statues and buildings, trees. I like to do that with the trees around my house. Uh, spots on paintings, halogen lights are the lights that really bring out the uh, color rendering of, uh, uh, of the art. Combined source types with wall, ceiling, floor colors and textures. Uh, so different types of fixtures and different locations and diff for different purposes. We'll talk about that a little more here. Coming up, a maximum natural daylight, of course. Uh, now, we want to look at now uh, some specific things. So this is something I got uh, uh, convinced the library to buy. It was very expensive. I think they got a little bit of a discount, but it was about $500. And so you see here next, a case study on galleries. So um, uh, this is uh, for the artwork. You want to focus on the artwork, you know, not the people. Um, uh, you want to use Northern sunlight um, for soft light, free of glare. It goes for all studios typically. Don't allow direct sunlight on the art. Uh, it can damage things. Um, uh, daylight uh, first and then highlight art as needed, only if needed. Uh, control magnitude of the spectrum, the intensity, distribution of the energies uh, to prevent damage. So you want to really consider that. Your art conservators can tell you more about that. Um, you're designing the space. Thermal effects of the light, right? You want to heat it up. Identify uh, high, low, uh, or no sensitivity art. So you light you light accordingly, or or put exhibit accordingly. Um, only use subtle or soft accent lighting. Accent lighting. Uh, for, uh, uh, not on art, but for wayfinding and highlighting architecture. Uh, minimize impact from adjacent high luminance spaces. So you've got hallways and bathrooms, sometimes food areas. Uh, so you might want a light lock, uh, like you see in theaters between the space, the art exhibit space, and if it's a big museum or art gallery. You want low reflectance everywhere in the activity spaces and the art space, ex exhibition space. Um, you want indirect lighting to enhance ambient light and find wayfinding and highlight architecture. Uh, use wall sconces, uh, that's a little like seashell things you can see on the wall. Sometimes uh, are there, are there, you know, uh, conical kind of things with the light shining up or down. Uh, pendants hanging down, chandeliers, up lighting, different ways of doing that. So here are some photos that I found off the internet of uh, different things. Some of these are things I've actually experienced. I've been to Venice four times and uh, it's one of my favorite places to go. Um, uh, once was at the Biennale. Biennale. Um, it's uh, here's somebody doing a project to resize a room, mixing natural and artificial light, you know, using those, design criteria, maybe they didn't have the, the design book with them, but they certainly seem to be adhering to the rules. Well, here's another one. Some of these I have visited, I recall this one here and this one here. And I believe, yeah, I would there and take a look at them this one from the source, and you can go there and take a look at them. Uh, I didn't edit these in any way. This is uh, just some really nice things to think about. So uh, firstly, you know, natural light, which we're talking about, uh, what path does your eye take through the room? Effect of color and lighting. Wall paint colors. Definitely has an effect on the lighting. Colored light, whether you color the lens itself or it's a pigment in the 
in the mixing of the glass or a diffuser or uh, different ways to make the light colored, LEDs, uh, via the technology internally. Color and emotion. How would you describe the color red? I mean, this varies by person, but you could generalize somewhat for most people. Color and emotion. Is blue a bus? Where does it take you? Hmm. More color and emotion. How would you bring in a breath of fresh air without opening a window? I could feel that. Certainly the ocean. If yellow is a song, what are the words? timeless color trends, right? So uh, if you lived through the 1980s, it was all pastel, especially in the Southwest, Texas, California, uh, everywhere. Um, and then of course in the 70s, gaudy primary colors, sometimes conflicting. And then I would think somewhat subdued in recent times, but there's, there's trends. So, you know, uh, you want to have somewhat timeless architecture if you can help it. Now, here's a couple other slides from another source. Uh, this is more of a, an engineering slash architectural still, but uh, this is getting more uh, specific about engineering kind of thing. So distinct contrast between individual zones and their surrounding. Um, and so you can do that with light. I won't read all these things, but you can vertical separations come back and students again this is should be several hours lecture at least two probably three would be best we'll finish this but you can very even less you're going to uh, jump over all that important thing to do right where we are here in central pennsylvania elizabethtown pennsylvania uh we're making this nearby tate towers and claire brothers and the rock Lidditz. Uh, tate towers is a former band manager for the yes and claire brothers are two engineers i believe from millersville they were acoustical engineers did audio thing a huge uh, huge concert uh, uh production people fly in all kinds of artists from uh taylor swift and uh, john mayer recently uh, and flying a helicopter there's all kinds of things going with it so um that's something nearby for people to think about. And of course, during COVID, which we're in the middle of now, I'm recording this November 2nd, 1st of uh, 2020, uh, this uh, production is not so big. Architectural lighting now, I'll take the time students uh, you know, class, we might even take and listen to this and comment while we're going in lecture time. Uh, I forget the exact time of this, but do listen to this. This is a very good thing on, uh, on lighting strategies, tips, and also lighting at nighttime. Another video, watch both those. Now, color temperature, when you're specifying uh, or picking uh, light bulbs uh, to go in your fixtures, you speak of uh, warm, cool, and daylight. And then there's a temperature rating in Kelvin, right? You know, Fahrenheit, Celsius, probably Kelvin's another temperature scale. You can look at the conversion for that. But this is how it's typically rated. And you can see the uh, uh, the effects and the appearance and the ambience and what it is best for each of them. Another graph showing some more details of that. And more details of that, giving an idea of how the relative uh, temperature in Kelvin makes a difference. Also uh, comparing color temperature with noon sunlight to the different types of fixtures that we're going to look at. Um, the uh, LEDs and uh, there's a laser in there too, tungsten filament, fluorescence. Now we want to speak about the color rendering index. This is very important to what uh, you see and how things actually appear. And it's on a scale to 0, 100. And daylight, of course, is going to give us the most uh, um, the most appropriate for the way our eyes work since we've adapted to sunlight uh, as living beings on this planet. Before we get into the color rendering index, though, we should uh, learn a little bit about additive and subtractive color. I'm going to skip over this because this is going to be part of your 
lecture, next lecture with monitors. So um, you can see there's talking about electromagnetic spectrum and additive and subtractive colors. We're going to, that'll be part of the next lecture coming up. And the computer monitors is actually the next lecture coming up too. Uh, but back to this lecture here, which is a different part. I'll go in here. Work such that it's a subtractive color process. And then uh, a little more here, you can look into the RGB values if you're interested. Now back to architectural color rendering. So we want to pick certain fixtures, specify fixtures for our clients as architects and engineers. And so uh, this is the uh, um, how the power distribution, spectral distribution for fluorescence light, lights work. And this is a warm white. You see a peaking in the red. And then cool white uh, peaks in the blue. Now you can buy daylighting bulbs, a little more expensive that uh, will give you uh, natural daylight fluorescent bulbs. I've bought those and even in the 80s. And then it's more like sunlight. I don't care for the wavelengths of uh, or the uh, fluorescent lighting myself, both color rendering and, uh, and the flicker. And the, you know, it's not uh, it's not true sunlight. So here's what the color rendering index will do for you. You can see 100 on the left and then a lower 170 on the right, all with the same uh, 2700 Kelvin temperature lighting source. You need to specify that as well. This is a comparison of different types of bulbs. You see on the far left, incandescent does represent the most closely to sunlight as well as halogen. You know, so it's very nice for artwork. And then uh, on the far right, the low pressure sodium. And uh, you'll see huge auditoriums some, or like gymnasiums filled with uh, this sometimes for the uh, for the light distribution. So again, halogen is, uh, is very good uh, for it's color rendering, and so use it in art uh, exhibits. LEDs um, are improving, but not yet replacing halogen. So you can research the different distributions there and see uh, halogen on the bottom left and uh, uh, filter daylight, nice even, relatively speaking, even distribution, and then what LEDs are getting close to. And there's quite a variety of LEDs that you can get different quality. Uh, then you want to be able to understand what you're looking at on the, on the label on the box. So you're just shopping in Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever, and or you're as an architect or engineer specifying these things. You should understand all the different things, uh, the energy uh, efficiency as well as the uh, lighting qualities. So we want to talk about two things here: uh, efficiency and efficacy. So um, first we're going to speak of just efficiency, which is somewhat intuitive. Uh, and that's the energy per square foot of the building that you're using. And so these are uh, standards here. Uh, and before you do you know, anything at all uh, of any quality, you're going to have a five of you know, watts per, per square foot to get lighting. But then if you're being wise about how you're doing it, scientific and uh, design-minded. ASHRAE, American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioners has, has a standard of 1.2. LEED, we know LEED, of LEED is a 0 0.9. And then 0 0.5 is the maximum possible that you could get um, during the day with daylighting issues. And now we see um, these percentages down below here. Uh, sunlight through clear glass, and how much is lost is heat. So we have you know, a pie chart, heat versus actual light. So you want to think about this. Uh, we'll think about this in efficacy too, when we're going to speak of in a minute. And then sunlight uh, through uh, spectrally selective low E kind of glass, and then you're going to get much more light and much less heat. And that's an ideal thing. And in most places, you may want to let the heat in, in the wintertime. So it depends again where you are, what you want to do. So um, we want to drill down a little bit now into, and this is now chapter four out of the one source textbook here. And uh, uh, most of what the slide is paraphrased somewhere in, in that chapter, mostly. Um, but again, visible light is part of electromagnetic spectrum. And you can go back and look in uh, photovoltaic uh, lectures uh, on that. 
Um, <clears throat> visible light is in a range of wavelengths directly related to our temperature of our sun, because that's where we are, the star that we're, uh, or our planets orbiting around. Uh, visible light versus thermal radiation. So that's the trade off. And so you want to see the uh, thermodynamic uh, trade off of that. And you go in that lecture of thermodynamics. And then you want to speak of the thermal range of th the range of thermal radiation, because when we do infrared uh, spectral uh, thermal imaging, and we want to understand the, uh, the R values of the envelope of the buildings, which we'll discuss later, uh, you want to you know, look for the heat. And so, you know, inf everything's giving off somewhat uh, heat, uh, but uh, including in the visible range, but it peaks quite a bit in the infrared, as you can see on this graph. Uh, now, <clears throat> there's details here you want to come back and look at, but this is a comparison and some terminology you definitely want to memorize of lumens, this rate the source emits and the flux, uh, the efficacy now, not efficiency, but this is lumens per watts. Um, and so you can see that. And that's, there's similar pie graphs here of light versus heat for incandescent, fluorescent. Uh, and then uh, you see some other comments you should come back and take a look at. And, and you know, some problems with fluorescence, how to solve that. And then comparing high pressure sodium, halogen, ceramic, metal halide, metal halide, and their efficacies, efficacies. And LEDs and where we're at, also you want to consider the life of all these devices. The LEDs are super high lifetime. Uh, it's coming down in cost now too. And a wide, wide range of efficacies, um, depending on how much you spend and great control over light quality. And you can read about some maximums possible here and how the human brain works uh, a little bit. I have reading at the end of this whole lecture that you can go and read a little more about that. Uh, also, light distribution, distribution. So this uh, sometimes written right in the box. Certainly in the spec sheets for from the manufacturers. Uh, if you're using Revit, you can get this out of the uh, BIM building information modeling uh, from the manufacturer, and suites, catalogs, and other places. And so you can see how the light's going to distribute. Uh, some other terminology you need to learn as architects, engineers, certainly as illumination uh, engineering uh, consultants, if you're going to do that. Um, I did a little bit of illumination design in a consulting firm in San Francisco, but it was secondary to what we were doing on the building. And I would not call myself an expert in this field, although I have quite a bit of education related to it. Illumination, um, and I've taught this stuff too. So illumination, uh, illuminance, illuminance per foot candle. Uh, lux, lux, so light incident on a unit area, right? Especially for task lighting. If you're working, you're cooking, or you're reading, or building a model, working in a factory with your hands near machinery. Uh, and then we have brightness versus luminance. Again, this is something you want to read a little bit more about uh, further reading at the end of, end of the chapter, but how the human uh, brain works and uh, what we see. So luminance is via light meter or your eye uh, versus brightness, which is perceived uh, as a function of the eye's adaptation and the psychology of it. You want to design for both. Uh, and uh, luminance uh, needed is a function of task, eye performance, psychology, contrast needed. And then you have very specific task foot candles needed. And to reduce glare, you want to use diffusers, lenses on the fixtures, lampshades, walls, and ceiling. Uh, colors and textures. There's also a brightness ratio you should be concerned with, and that's the contrast between adjacent spaces. Uh, you can see it, uh, it's analogous to lighting ratio in photography or uh, film production, where you can see the uh, girl's face is not lit up on the far right evenly, on the far left it is, and then I put a picture of myself where I do a similar thing, zooming near the, the window with the sunlight on me. Uh, which I know it's doing that. I kind of like the effect, actually. And then finally here, uh, before we look, go into further reading, just consider the energy use and production overall. And so lighting technologies, due to great innovations in the United States and elsewhere, is now not a, as much of a contributor to the, the, the electrical load. It's still a big contributor. And you can see now uh, sustainable, uh, renewable energy Consumption, consumption. Hopefully, we can do better than that. 
Uh, and we certainly can do much better than this. You just, you're looking here now at, uh, you look at the graph, all solar compared to, uh, uh, and this is our production compared to at the top here, all fuels. So we're still burning coal and we're still uh, burning oil. And uh, that needs to be changed. You say, oh, we only could do so well. Well, okay. Here's another developed country. Uh, look at what Germany's doing, where it's at. In energy use, first of all, consumption. And how they have really dedicated themselves to solar as well as wind offshore. I didn't realize until I looked at this graph, that was that big. I knew they have been to Germany and Austria a couple of times. And so I know the dedication they have. And I work with a uh, German company. I'm actually a U.S. representative for or was the first for the Edgenet uh, Phoenix contact. Uh, German production, right? Sustainables, renewables. And just look at how much they've done. And this is a very recent graph. graph. Again, Germany. So uh, it doesn't mean we're not doing things here. This is uh, we have electrical load balancing and uh, uh, power companies have different rate structures, the rates of dollars that they charge you based on uh, a number of things. There's a whole power factor thing. I talk about in other lectures of where you have reactive, real and reactive power and how you can uh, you know, put a bank of parallel capacitors in, uh, in a factory to compensate for bad power factor due to the inductive loads of all the motors. That's a whole different thing, but we're talking about the loads here of actually on peak demand, you tax the grid and the generation. So there's, uh, it's bad for the grid and actually you get a penalty for using electricity during peak times. Um, and so this uh, next thing we look at, Sustainax, founded by one of my students in 2004. Um, and this is uh, what he did, had uh, 100 employees at one time, got a picture of him. Hillary Clinton actually went and visited him. And uh, the idea is they compress, get, compress air during the non-peak times and then release it and generate electricity with that. And then that effect is a cost savings. So you can see more about him and, and this lecture and more about previous things students have done with me. He actually raised $100,000 for the first uh, robot that we had an international competition. Then when he went and got his master's PhD and then raised $12 million in venture capital and uh, had uh, actually 200 employees at one time. And so supplemental reading, you can learn first about lead points, go in there and take a look at all that and credits you get. Um, and then stuff on uh, from my uh, the, uh, illumination engineering uh, handbook on vision eyes and brain, the physiology, and then non-visual effects of performance perception. And then related things in high tech, human versus computer vision, how our eyes actually work and our brain too, uh, in addition to what you learn above about the brain. And then the physics display technology and computer graphics cards. Now, again, this whole lecture went through very fast. Uh, this would be definitely two lectures, maybe more. You wanna look at all the videos, drill down, take a time and understand everything. Uh, I would say you should spend at least three hours on this. So you see, this is a, this lecture is intended for architecture student, architectural engineers, sustainable engineers, but it crosses over somewhat. I've skipped over some things for your sake, but you see that I'm also referring the architecture students to things that you're learning in here, uh, and the color physics and display technologies, which we're going to do next, and the graphics boards. So this is your domain here, but it, and you know the overlap. Uh, is you, know, you can see the overlap, <clears throat> hopefully. All right, so we're wrapping up here. Uh, you can see the progression now. Uh, in the YouTube channel, I, now I don't know if I'm gonna wrap around all of these lectures. Some of them I'll just play uh, or just speak out loud. Some of them just really, really fast going through them. Uh, but this was again from COVID times and now I'm uh, now we don't need to do that. So after today, we are all uh, in person on Friday. I apologize if one person didn't get the email in time, I guess, and showed up uh, live. But uh, you know, with weather and also a couple of people requesting because of commuting 
and one person who couldn't make it because of extenuating circumstances. So we're accommodating. Um, so let's see, YouTube channel. Uh, da, 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 and then in here, we were back in here. So uh, in the class uh, over here, putting all back in context where we are, wrapping up here is we're down in a, in a subgroup here. We just did human vision and most of this natural man-made lighting from this course. Uh, you know, you could go in there and see, just click on it for a second, come right back. And you can see there's a ton of other stuff going on in that class, uh, but that's not your world or your choice of uh, field, but it's overlapping again with you guys. And then we're gonna go right into computer monitors uh, on Friday. And I will, I will uh, also videotape that, we record that one, maybe do the graphics boards too. But you know, so like this video today is including 21 and 22 here, human vision and natural man-made lighting. And then we'll start out on, uh, on uh, Friday. And here, I'll just give you a preview of that real quick. And then we'll end here, uh, you know, just like 60 seconds in here. You can see this is, uh, understanding display. So here's the color, the additive and subtractive color things, RGB values, then drilling down into the physics of different monitors, monitors starting with the, you know, what's an ancient relic now, CRTs, but still you should understand that. And then LCDs and how those work. Uh, and then some uh, unbiased testing laboratory results, the PC Magazine and Consumer Reports on that. And then plasma displays and how all that works. And then uh, unbiased testing lab results, you know, Pew diagram kind of things that you do in other courses for evaluating things. Consumer reports, I highly recommend that for uh, any of you. And then we'll watch, uh, uh, we'll look at excerpts of this one video for assessing all the different qualities of monitors and uh, then what most of the engineers know how to do this anyway, if not others, the Pew diagrams, Pew matrix, where you're doing a decision analysis. Um, and you'll see, I, I'm not gonna drill down here on this today and show you, but you'll have upcoming uh, uh, tasks. They're all, uh, for the whole course, everything's laid out now, including when your final exam is. So I decided not to do uh, a midterm. I, I've given you projects all along a little thing every week now, so pay attention to that because you'll start losing big points if you're late on all that. Uh, do turn on th in things even if they're very late. I can't guarantee how many points you'll get, but it uh, depends how late it is. Um, but you do have a whole thing where you're just looking at graphics cards coming up uh, and you're picking ones and you want to compare and contrast them. And this is a formal way of doing that. So this, this is what we'll do on Friday. All right. So, uh, See where we are here. Oops. Toolbars up here. Okay, stop sharing. All right, so we did get on time there. We are at uh, about 20 after I start another class in a couple minutes. So um, let me disconnect here. I'll stay on for about a minute or two and answer questions, but I got to get to the next group of students. You got everything you need to know uh, in this recording. And uh, and again, you don't get tested till the end of the semester, and I'll give you a final exam review. Uh, but you do have a lot of little projects to start working on coming up. So look at those, and we'll look at those on Friday too. Friday is in class, in person, and you know, we should be, unless extenuating circumstances of some kind prevent it, or, you know, I get an ex excess of requests for some reason. I mean, there's things that happen. COVID comes and goes, of course, as we've seen now three times with, uh, you know, Alpha, Delta, and Omicron, and then uh, who knows, uh, whether things or sports things, I don't know, something come up where I say, okay, let's just be online. But the policy as of Friday, even though it initially intended for it to be today, as of Friday, we are in person, do come to class. Uh, I do have one person who's, who can't because of extenuating circumstances, and I'm recording for that person. But I can't guarantee I'm gonna record every day from now on, you really need to get into the classroom and we need to uh, reestablish ourselves as humans away from screens. Uh, so um, I will ask at times people just completely turn off their technology Maybe we can go outside and uh, luckily we won't have masks on anymore so we can 
look at each other and uh, as we talk. Um, okay, I'm going to stop recording now.